Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, friends. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode. Today, you'll meet a physical therapist who has evolved her work through pain neuroscience education onto cognitive behavioral therapy, and today is using acceptance and commitment therapy in the very unique environment of a prison. My guest this week is Mary Doyle, who's been a practicing physical therapist since 1995. Her career started out in outpatient orthopedics, and she eventually moved to home care, where she treated both geriatric and pediatric patients in the home. Looking for a change from driving and the ever-increasing hurdles of insurance, she moved to correctional facility work in 2016. Today, she functions in a primary care physical therapy practice within a prison environment, and she combines physical therapy with acceptance and commitment therapy for the treatment of pain and other chronic lifestyle conditions. On today's episode, you'll learn how Mary uses acceptance and commitment therapy to target the important psychosocial variables for prisoners in the prison environment. And if you're interested in learning about combining pain neuroscience education, mindfulness, and ACT, just like Mary does, make sure to check out my latest book, Radical Relief, A Guide to Overcome Chronic Pain. Radical Relief is available now on Amazon and in most countries. Okay, without further ado, let's begin and let's meet Mary Doyle and learn about combining ACT with physical therapy. Hi, Mary. Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast. It's great to have you here this week. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to you as well. Mary, you work in a very specific and distinct practice setting, which is a prison setting, a prison environment. And I can't wait to hear everything about that and the great work you're doing there. The moment I met you and I heard about the work you do, it just, it was, first of all, it was moving for me to hear how you embody so much of physical therapy and psychologically informed care. And then I just think about the patient population that you're working with. And I can't wait to dive into that further. But before we do that, you've been a physical therapist since 1995. So this is not new to you. Yeah. Tell me about the, I guess, the major practice settings that you've worked in, what your experience was like in them and how that led up to the prison environment that you work in today? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I started, I'm an athlete, so like a lot of PTs and I tore my ACL and I wanted to go into outpatient orthopedics. So that's where I started. I spent about three years doing that. I got a little bit tired of it um, and wanted to try something new um, because, and I had always just wanted to work with athletes, but when I switched, I tried home care. And then I love, I loved working with geriatrics. I loved um, being out and being able to work with people individually and not having quite so much of a time schedule and time crunch. Um, and so I stayed in with that. I did a little bit of home care with pediatrics as well. So I was doing pediatrics and geriatrics. Um, and I did that for 14 years or so. <laughs> and um, and it, it was really rewarding and interesting. Um, but uh, at the time I actually was doing a lot of, I was still doing athletics. I was doing triathlons and I, I row. So I was doing com competitions with rowing and I was starting to de develop my own pain. And I found that driving made it worse. And then all the notes that we have to do and how particular they are and how much patient we need um, took, was taking up a lot of time. And so I, just got an email from a headhunter said, you know, Hey, there's this opportunity. I'm like, Oh, okay. It's an opportunity. Let's see what it is. And then I emailed back that I would be interested. And they said, Oh, it's at a prison. I'm like, Oh, could I work in a prison? <laughs> I've never had anything to do with anything like law wise or criminal wise. And so I gave it a shot and I went for the interview and they gave me the tour and I'm like, okay, I'm going from nice houses to this, and I think I can do it. <laughs> so I did it. And it's been, it's been great. I love it. I absolutely love going to work every day. <laughs> and just tell us what that work environment is like for you. Do you have um, a, a physical therapy gym? Where do you provide care for people? 
What does that so look I, like? What does that look like? Because obviously you mentioned you, you've worked in an outpatient setting. Most outpatient settings um, have private treatment rooms and lots of gym equipment. You've worked in you know people's homes, which is a great environment for working with the people who are aged and the elderly. And mm-hmm. then I, I'm trying to imagine because I've never um, been in a prison with regard to physical therapy or anything else. So I'm trying to imagine what that environment is like for you. So it does vary from prison to prison. Like I actually. Um, I don't know a lot of other states what they have, but I've heard from inmates what kind of that there's sometimes they have gyms and sometimes they have a lot of equipment um, and they have modalities. I actually don't have much of that at where I work right now. I have a treatment room, I have a table um, and I have one tens unit and uh, no hot packs, no ice, no. So I don't really do any of that. They can get ice on their own. So I do a lot of, you know, telling them, you know, things that, that can help them. And then there, it's up to them. And I do, um, like, as far as equipment, I, I have some water bottles to use for resistance and a band or two, but um, I try to use what they have access to so that they can continue on their own. And they don't have a lot of, you know, gym equipment in their cells. <laughs> so. Yeah. And are you seeing people individually in individual sessions or are you doing group? Is it a mix where, where you are? It's all individual. They come in, oh, and like getting to my office, just to give you an idea, I have to go through 15 locked doors and gates that I don't have keys to. Wow. Um, so there's always somebody kind of overhead watching and they open the gate for you. Sometimes they see you, sometimes you have to wait a little bit. Um, and, uh, And so then I do see people individually. I have several places. Um, I work in a fairly large prison. um, And so I go to different places in that prison. I have one treatment room in the main part where they come to me. And then I have a couple of other treatment rooms where um, they still still come to me, but it's like closer to where their housing is. And I work in, um, there's several levels of prisoners too. Um, So there's a minimum security and then there's maximum and then there's super max. And I see all three. Um, there are more officers that need to be closer by when you're seeing the max and the super max. And they have to have, um, sometimes have to have handcuffs on and while they're in there. Sure. And that, how do these uh, inmates find you? Are they referred to you inside the prison or are they, is it an injury that happened with, when they were in the prison or something that was pre-existing? I'm just trying to imagine you know, oftentimes there's a referral that's been made to see a yes. physical therapist. Does that work the same in the prison? And so it's the same. Yes, they have referrals. Um, it's a it's a pretty complex medical system. And uh, that's been a, a big thing in prisons um, since like the nine, like the seventies, they were kind of like, oh, oh, maybe these people need care. And there was a big landmark um, law case about it too. And uh, so it's been gradually improving. So it's a pretty fairly sophisticated medical system. Um, they have nurse practitioners, they have a lot of nurses. So when a prisoner feels bad or they feel like something needs looking at, they put in a sick call and then they're seen. And then they, you know, if they, they see a provider, the provider decides they need therapy, they send, they send me the referral. And, and are, you out, are, you, are you outside of the insurance realm? So is there- We are totally outside of the insurance realm. And let me tell you, that is such a freedom <laughs> for me um, because I am, so I'm just, I'm beholden to the person in front of me. I want to make them better, but I don't have anybody telling me how long I need to see them, how, how long each session needs to be, I, what I should be doing in each session for this diagnosis. They, I don't have any of that, which is really nice. It's really interesting. So you're really almost functioning in a primary care capacity within the community of a prison yes. inmates that are there. Yes. And I get to do, and what's nice is I get to do a lot of communicating with the other practitioners. I can, you know, I can communicate with mental health when things are going on, they can communicate with me and they do often and uh, mental health and the nurse practitioners. And so we, yeah. So that's really good. <laughs> what are the challenges of working within a correctional facility just in general, you know, for you as a physical therapist and then just in general? In general, well, so some of the things that are a little restricting are um, that there are certain times that you can't see people because they have count time. So they all have to be in their cells when they need to be counted. Um, 
And then if anything happens in the facility and it needs to be locked down, then you're not seeing anyone. So like you had your day planned and you thought it was gonna go one way and then you need to change up what you're doing. Um, and that happens kind of, and not super often, but it, especially more on the Mac side, like one build, you won't be able to see anybody in, in one certain building and you have to kind of adjust where you're going. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that can be hard. And then people, they move frequently. So you thought they were in one place and you needed to see them there, but then they're in another place. But I mean, and that's part of the prison system. They really try to do a good job of keeping people that can function well together in the same place. It's, mm -hmm. it's really complicated. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just trying to imagine as a physical therapist coming into that environment, what type of skills did you bring with you that made the transition and the treatment of those inmates and those, those people easier for, for you as a professional and obviously for them with regard to receiving care. Right. Um, so inmates, uh, they're really interesting people to work with. Um, they're really, uh, and I had no expectation, like I kind of didn't know what to expect when I first got there of like, you know, the people that I would be working with. And it turned out, oh, they're just regular people <laughs> and they're here. And so um, th that, that was interesting. And, uh, but then like, once you get to know them more, you start to find out um, more of their anxieties and the depression and they, they open up to you a little bit more. And you see how much more of that that is present in the prison than there is on the outside and the PTSD and um, head injuries. And they've all had tremendous trauma in their past. Um, and so things that really helped me with working with that was, you know, I'm, I was just always the type of person to kind of allow people to be who they were. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't force my agenda on people. Although like as a PT, I was usually instructing people on what to do. That was like what I did. I tried to share my knowledge with them, but, um, I, and let them be in like respect their differences and respect who they are. Um, so that was helpful. Also, you know, just being very forgiving, you know, they don't show up, they don't show up, they don't show up. I keep, I keep, keep them on the schedule. It's okay. I know that they have things going on in their lives that may, that PT may be taking a back seat for them. And so I just, I, I allow them to be, to do what they feel like they need to do. And I think that helped, that helps me. It helps them to trust me more. It helps them to know that I'm gonna be there for them any, you know, no matter what they do. And they need that, they need that a lot. <laughs> so the psychosocial variables are, sounds like they're, they're quite palpable once, yes. you get, once you get to know your patients. And I'm sure that comes up um, maybe not in the initial history, because it sounds like there's a little bit of... Um, no, it does take a little time. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times when you first meet them, um, some of them, they, they kind of put up a front <laughs> and, and they make everything really shiny for you. Oh, there's not, not really that much I can see going on here, um, but let's keep you on. We'll try this. And then, you know, after a few visits, then it starts coming out. Like why? Why they're having so much pain and it's so persistent. So when you first started using psychosocial skills in combination with physical therapy, what did you first start using? Um, so, you know, I always kind of had those, the skills that we all have as PTs, you know, kind of just allowing people to be where they are and kind of respecting their differences and respecting their anxieties and those kind of things. Um, and then like the, the thing that kind of, tipped me over was I, I finally went to a chronic pain course, which um, had that model of the biopsychosocial um, on it and was emphasizing, oh, the psycho part is really important. I'm like, oh, that's a part I don't really address very much. <laughs> I mean, I let, you know, I kind of always kind of steered around it and allowed it, but I didn't address it. I'm like, oh, I, I bet I could do it. Actually, it was, it was kind of, you know, cause I would, I would read up on people's past. So I kind of knew what they were coming to me with. And, um, and, and, and so I could see where the anxiety or the depression and stuff was affecting the things that they were, was impacting the things that they were telling me. And I'm like, if I could just address some of this, it would 
it would help what I'm doing. It would help me be better. So started looking into that. And uh, I took a, a course on CBT and um, that was really helpful. Uh, but it also was, um, it didn't address everything. It wasn't, I, I don't know, I'm getting ahead of myself now, but <laughs> it didn't address things the way acted because it still kind of put them in the wrong. Like your thoughts are not right. Let's try to change what your thoughts are. And it worked for, it would work for some, but it, it some people, they are really wedded to their thoughts. <laughs> I like the way you put, I like the way you put that. They're really wed to their thoughts. It's a really um, nice metaphor to use. So take me back to the CBT course you took first, because you took a CBT course first. Mm -hmm. And was that actually before that I took a chronic pain course. Mm -hmm. And that was what super opened my eyes up because I hadn't really had pain science before that. I was still on the old treatment model. And I was like, oh my gosh, does everybody know this? And I didn't know. <laughs> and <laughs> so that took me down a big old rabbit hole. I started, you know, looking tons of stuff. I'm like, oh my gosh, so many. And, but then I started, you know, I would talk to other professionals. I'm like, oh no, nobody knows about this. Why doesn't anyone know about this? And so I started telling everyone about it, teaching the nurses, teaching the practitioners. I'm like, oh, oh, you need to know this. This is why they're acting the way they are. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, that chronic pain course really um, opened, opened my eyes. And then I started learning about yeah, Laura Mosley and all those, all those guys and how we need stories. And <laughs> so. Uh, and what was the CBT course? Uh pain specific or was it more it was actually it was pain specific it was most i think i was the only physical i think there was an occupational therapist in there too mm -hmm. but it was mostly um mental health practitioners and it was for treating pain specifically and it was great it was a really good course so dealing with things like cognitive distortions yep. intermediate beliefs core beliefs all that is common in yep. a framework of like a traditional CBT. They did like the motivational interviewing, talked about that and um, ants trying to get the automatic negative thoughts, addressing those and, and gave several techniques to use. And I found, yeah, I found that really helpful. So how long did you kind of run that, so to speak, in your practice? How long did you run CBT before you started touching base with some of the act skills? So I... It was, I was doing pain science and CBT and I was still just learning a lot. I was looking at YouTube. I was watching, you know, lectures. I was watching things on behavior. Um, and then I stumbled on your podcast and starting to listen to all of that. And then I came on, you know, so your podcast early on had some act stuff in it. I'm like, Ooh, act, that sounds like fun. And then, <laughs> Uh, one of the psychologists, the doctorate psychologist that was um, at the prison was doing a lecture. They had a lecture series. They had one every month for a little while. And one of them was on act. I'm like, oh, this is it. This is where, this is what they need to do. But it was, it was complicated. And there was all those metaphors. And I'm like, I can't really, I know that's kind of where I need to go, but I couldn't figure out like how to put it in play. Mm -hmm. And that's when I took your that's when I took the exposure course first. And then I took the act for chronic pain. Yeah. Cause, cause when you, if, when you first come across act and especially depending on who's teaching it, it does sound quite complicated. Yeah. Lots mm -hmm. of fancy terms, some words that are new, like diffusion is not even technically a, a, a real word. It's a, you know, metaphorical act right. word. And then you have this model with all these processes and how do you start to put this into play? Right. Yep. What do you find is really useful about ACT with working with people who are currently inmates mm -hmm. and helping them with their either acute or chronic health conditions? The A number one first thing, most the best thing about it is just your therapeutic stance. Is just you are with them on their side. They are not wrong. I, that was an adjustment for me of like trying to figure out what they did wrong, trying to figure out, you know, well, what did you do that made you hurt more? No, you're not wrong. Getting them to be not wrong. 
boy, that helps so much. And then just not contradicting their thoughts. Because when you contradict their thoughts, they, the wall goes up and they can't, they can't listen to anything else. And so that stance is the most useful thing out of ACT that I've gotten. So you're talking about this stance, the ACT stance, which those who study ACT are familiar with it. Was it hard for me to go from, you know, CBT, let's say, to acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, with regard to adopting a new stance and how you approach working with your patients? Yes, it was. I found it really uh, a change for me to go from that instructor mode. I'm the one that knows stuff. Let me let me enlighten you. If you know this stuff, you're going to get better. Um, and it just wasn't. It, sometimes it would work. Sometimes it would be okay, and they would be ex- absorbing it. But a lot of times they wouldn't. And so we'd just be at the same plot. Okay, let me let me tell you about it again. Let me tell you a different way. Let me use this instead. And they still just wouldn't get it because I'm still on the other side telling them what to do, mm-hmm. telling them what to think, or telling them how they should be thinking. And um, that's where ACT really helps in it's allowing them to get that confidence up that they can help themselves. That's so hard because they walk in, they walk into the clinic and they expect you to fix them. They expect to be better walking out, but they have a super mistrust of the whole medical system of anything coming from the Department of Corrections. And so if you're not saying exactly what here, they're not going to listen. <laughs> and then they're not going to do the things that they need to do in order to get better. They have to be able to think of it themselves. And we have to be, I have to be able to guide them so that they can get there. Right. So ACT is a, so when I think of traditional CBT and pain education, um, there's a, a definitely an approach of, let me provide, provide you with some information mm-hmm. about what's happening. Mm-hmm. I'll give you some data. I'll share some of my knowledge and then we'll change all of this. Yeah. Where in ACT, we really don't rely heavily on didactic instruction. We don't rely heavily on sharing of information, although that piece is there. It's fine to add in a little bit of pain science or pain neuroscience education mm-hmm. into your treatment and combine that with ACT. But there's not a heavy emphasis on modifying thoughts, changing beliefs, And I think what you're saying is you're working with a population where it could be very difficult to change their beliefs, not only because of the environment they're currently in, but because of the entire uh, world they've lived in that may have led them up to that. Yes, that led them to that point. They are all, you know, the only one that they can rely on is themselves. And so they just, they really... Um, have to, re, you know, they have to go with what they're thinking. They have to, and they defend that to the end. Yeah. So, as you so I try to show them where their thinking is really good, where it's helping them, where it's helping them get where they want to go. Right. So to normalize their thoughts first, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. As you started using these skills, I'm wondering if you noticed a change in yourself. Did the inmates you work with notice that change? How did that start to play out in your work? Ooh, I'm not sure if they noticed a change. Um, I could ask some of my, they probably did because uh, of course uh, um, I try to keep them on. I try to keep seeing my patients until they feel like they're ready to be on their own. Um, And now I don't see them very frequently. I'll see them once a month with COVID. It was less frequent than that. But um, I did get to the point, you know, I had been, you know, we had, some of us, had, I'd been, some of them I've been with for a couple of years and they would see the changes that I went through. I'm like, okay, we, you know, this is what we did before, but this is what, you know, let's try something else. What are you thinking about that? And, you know, and how you're feeling and, and that kind of thing. Um, and it was really interesting, those patients that I had had for a long time how they responded to ACT and how it made them change. I mean, I know it changed me too, like how I was processing my thinking, but um, just seeing them change themselves too. And 
just knowing that it wasn't really anything that I did to change them. They, they really did it themselves. What's been difficult about learning ACT and infusing your physical therapy practice with ACT in the environment that you work in? Um, it was a little bit, so I tried to, you know, do, I was doing all pain science for a little bit and then doing all CBT and then doing all ACT. And then uh, sometimes the exercise kind of dropped out the back. Yeah. So, so I had to reintroduce, especially with no equipment. And I didn't have any equipment. They didn't want, they didn't want to exercise. I don't want to do anything today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's just talk a little bit. You can exercise when you're ready to, but now I've been able to, now I'm integrating it back in. I'm getting it back in um, so that we're doing some movements so I can do more of the thoughts and the exposure with the exercise. Um, that, that was good. Um, that helped me. Um, and then what was the question again? Let's see. <laughs> what was difficult? Um, all the processes kind of getting them all set in um, and figuring out when to do what, um, that it just took some talking with the patients. And then sometimes I would just really hit on something. Like one time uh, I was working with a patient and he was very stuck on his pain and that, you know, it's caused by this and I'm never getting rid of it. And we were trying, I was working on some, um, some acceptance work and he talked about, you know, so we started talking about other things. He talked about his celly and that he really didn't like his celly, but he didn't want to move him either. He tolerated him because he was a really, he was really tidy and very clean. And he liked that about him. And so I was, oh, I hit on that one. I'm like, hey, do you think maybe you could sometimes think about your pain that way? Like it's necessary. You don't like it, but it has a function in your life. And, uh, and so we, and we went with that and he, he's, he, he, I see, I've seen him for a long time. He comes back often, but um, sometimes he does a lot better. <laughs> so you mentioned you're using your act skills as it helps with exposure. Mm -hmm. Act in many ways is a type of exposure therapy, which is so important with regard to our work as physical therapists, because we're exposing people to uncomfortable exercises or at times painful exercises. Even manual therapy can be painful. At, at certain times, but you also have started to combine it with some Tai Chi as well. I know there are some similarities to ACT and Tai Chi. Can you talk about the simil similarities and how that uh, started? Okay, oh, well, I do. So I teach a Tai Chi class in the prison and that came up actually as a request from an inmate who had heard that Tai Chi helps your cardiovascular system. So. I went and got certified. And the more I learned about Tai Chi, the more I saw how much it had to do, how, how many parallels it had with the neuroscience that we know and all the things that we do in ACT, which works on your neuroscience. Um, and it's the mindfulness and it's the slow moving and it's the working your brain. You have to remember the moves that you're doing and the sequence of the moves. And, but it's also about breathing and it's about being calm. And um, so it really, um, I started to integrate the act into my Tai Chi class, just with some of the cues and the noticing things and the mindfulness. Um, and uh, it was helpful, I think. I think it, it, it gave them a lot. I had some really regular guys that would never miss a class. Mm. Act has six core processes acceptance, diffusion, present moment awareness, selfless context, values, and committed action. Is there one process you found to be most helpful working with the population you're, you work with each day? Um, I don't know if most helpful. Is it more that I just go back to all the time? I, I do try to emphasize the values. Um, and I go back to their values uh, frequently, almost every session. I, I try to take it back to what are you really here for? What are you working towards? Because that's, that's the thing that's going to motivate them. Um, it's going to get them where they need to go. 
Um, a lot of times they have the most difficulty with the acceptance part or, or, or the end diffusion too. I mean, they're just, yeah, um, the, those parts are, are, I work on, um, but I always come back to the values, no matter what I'm working on, come back to the values because, and you'll find, I, what I find is when they look at their own that, like a lot of times they don't know, they have no idea. Oh, I have values. Um, or, you know, they've been just so obsessed with all the injustices that are around them, all the injustices that, that have been put on them. They're just angry. Um, they're always in pain. They just lose sight of the things that are actually important to them. And if I get them to refocus, they, they start to improve. So it's really interesting because when you mention values, the first thing that comes to my mind is how can someone begin to act on their values if they're literally behind bars? Oh yeah, it's really hard. Oh, they are, mm-hmm. So sometimes I need to give them a little, little bit of prompts. <laughs> um, and because, and they feel like it's such a big barrier. They, But it, it's funny because some of them, I'll give them the bullseye and they'll be in the center for everything. Oh no, I'm doing everything. I'm, I'm great. <laughs> and, um, and then there's other people, you know, they're just, everything's all in the, I had, there is no way I can move on these values. It's just too restrictive. Um, and, it, and it just goes back, it's, everybody's a very individual. Um, and, and we try to figure out like where, what small move they can make, what, what little thing they can do. Can you call this person again? Mm -hmm. I know you haven't called them in a really long time, but that's a person that's really important to you. You think maybe you could try it again, even if they don't respond, you could write them a letter. Because it's not about them. Re it's not about that person on the outside responding to them. It's more about them thinking about that person that's important. Right. So I'm going to write them a letter, even if you don't send it. Them acting in line with their values, even though they're in a prison. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, I don't know, it may be someone values being a supportive father to, to his child, mm -hmm. but yet he is in that environment. So he may not see his child every day. So values seem like they're distant from him, right? Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is like just a phone call or just a letter yep. or taking care of your health today may be a way that helps you with your values with regard to that interaction with family. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They all, you know, health is really important to them. They, they understand that health is important and they like cognitively know what they need to do to get that health. But then all the other stuff, all their, you know, I just really want this. I just really want these chips. I just really, I just really don't want to get up today. You know, those things come on them and, and getting them to refocus, you know, on, on their health and, but actually, and getting them to focus more on those other values too, can get them up and moving, which gets them more into the health. So if they do get up, write that letter or they go, um, and I, you know, some, some of these, you know, they loved fishing. They used to go fishing. They used to be out in the woods all the time. And now they're, he, you know, now they're in prison. I'm like, and what we have a lot of outdoors. I'm like, just when you're outside, notice what's out there. There's, you know, you get, um, take what's, take what you have now and, and use it and just be in, and, and then I get into the present moment stuff and the mindfulness and yeah. It's, that's like a great environment that really requires you to kind of dig deep and get creative and use all your skills, which I think is so yes. fascinating because ACT is a very experiential exercise mm -hmm. and experiential is probably, I would imagine, easier when you're in an environment where you have things to work with, but you have a little bit less. So you're really focusing on that relationship with someone. Mm -hmm helping them look at their values and say, okay, how can you make that little tiny step today? Which I think is so important, even for people with chronic pain who, who are outside of the prison system, that if you can just make that small change today, you're one step closer to something really wonderful in your life. If you had to provide advice or give a, some advice to a physical therapist who has heard about ACT, but they're not sure, or they're not sure, about using psychologically informed, you know, physiotherapy in general, what advice would you give to them with regard to learning ACT? Um, well, the first bit of advice is to just start doing, using the processes on yourself. And you have to live ACT, well, you don't have to live it, but it, it makes your life so much better. 
I actually been, I do it a little bit with my coworkers too. I, I find that it helps them a lot. Um, and they know that they can come to me. They're really comfortable with me and I, you know, and I'm going to give them that little bit. <laughs> and it, because there's so much, there's a lot of burnout in with the workers. Um, they're super dedicated though. They are really dedicated people. Um, in there. So you getting the act, going through the processes on yourself, um, learning what your values is, what, what is motivating you? Why are you going to work every day? And then, um, where you're fused. Yep. Where you're fused, the notice when, when you're doing things the same old way, when you're not in the present moment process. Yep. When it's difficult for you to contact other, um, contexts in life and move in and out of those contexts, even though, you may not want to. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then just allowing things to be as they are, allowing things that you can't control or you feel really uncomfortable with. Um, I picked up, uh, since listening to your podcast, I started doing my own meditation. I used to think it was a big waste of time back in my youth. And <laughs> now I do it every day. And it's really important. And so I really understand when I'm teaching these skills to inmates too, and they have such a hard time with it because they're so distracted. Um, that like, I understand, I understand how hard it is. Uh, I, I did, when I first started doing meditation, I, I did a one minute meditation and then I didn't go back to it for a month. And, but now it's, I, now I can do it every day and it's so helpful. Um, and then just knowing who you are and what your part is in the world they didn't get that growing up. They, I mean, sometimes uh, some of them did. Some of them are very uh, intelligent and, and had a good upbringing, but a lot of them didn't and just have no idea what, what their place is. Um, and so that self as context really helps. Um, and then just the committing to your values, doing the commitment. I love the commitment worksheets. Um, I love using motivational interviewing and having them tell me everything to put on that sheet. I'm like, okay, now you can do this. So Mary, you've studied pain science education, cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. Why is it a radical idea for physical therapists and other health professionals to use the mind as part of their treatment with regard to chronic pain? Um, it's radical because we're, because we're humans and that's not what we do. We like to go with the status quo and what we've always done. And because it's comfortable and it's easy and we know what we're doing. Um, so there's a, there's a story that I like um, and I heard it on, on uh, some lecture, a, a lecture that I was listening to, um, but it's about a, a gentleman, a doctor in England. Have you ever heard of the, the well, the Broad Street well? story. Okay. So this is in the, um, in the 1850s, they still thought that viruses and disease were, um, spread by miasmas by what you smell. And, um, this was a time in London where cholera outbreaks were pretty frequent. And so this doctor was, uh, a Dr. Snow, he was an obstetrician and he had this theory, like there were all these people getting cholera and dying right around where he was working. And it was really affecting the community and it was in like businesses were leaving. And he kind of suspected it had something to do with the water supply, but he didn't, he didn't have any proof for that. So he started gathering it. So he started looking at all the people that died and where they lived and what they, and where they were getting their water. And then he started looking at the places that the people weren't dying one of which happened to be a prison. And he went there and he asked them and found out they had their own well. And then he went to another place. It was a brewery. They also had their own well. Nobody was dying there, but everybody around them was dying. So he's like, it's this well. And then, um, so he, he gathered his evidence. He was going to the hospitals and finding out who was dying from cholera. And then he had this couple, a uh, niece, um, an aunt and her niece died like two miles away. And he found out that they actually were getting bottled water from the same well shipped over to them. And that's why they died. So he took all his information to the authorities and he said, you got to take the handle off this well. Um, and it took a lot of convincing and the authorities didn't want to do it, but eventually they did and the death stopped. But they still didn't believe him. They still didn't, you know, they didn't want to make any changes because, um, and there were like cesspools near the well and it was leaking. <laughs> and so there was a reverend uh, that tried to 
that wanted to disprove this theory that it was coming from the well because he wanted it to be divine justice. He wanted it to be like God's retribution. And so he started gathering evidence and gathering evidence, the Reverend did. And when he actually, when he brought forth his evidence, it all just supported what this Dr. Snow was doing and found out actually the, the one source of how the cholera got into the well. And this is a good 40 years before they even knew what bacteria and viruses were. And so then, it took another how long before cities would clean up and have their um, sewage systems separate from their water systems. People just don't want to change. They don't want to know that something is new, that it's not the way that you thought it was. And so, and we're in that same situation now. We're about 20 years into this pain science thing. Oh my God, I, you know, I still <laughs> kick myself. I'm like, they knew about this for 20 years and I didn't know, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But this is where we are now too. I mean, we need to spread this word. And once we get it spread out, then we are all gonna be working on the psychological part because the, psych the mind and the body are one thing and they work together and they can't be separated. Right. It was a little bit of being uncomfortable as a professional to, I think learning, we're comfortable learning because that's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, inbred in us. We're, we're good with learning new things. But then using something new in practice can be a little uncomfortable. Yes. And you, because have, to, you have to try it makes something. We're uncomfortable new. because they're not expecting it. They're not the, the people, the people that see us come in with expectations. Right. And if we're not exactly what they expect, then they can go somewhere else. Well, they can't when they're in prison, but. <laughs> like you said, that we can't separate the mind and the body at this point. So how can we not take this work and adopt it to clinical practice, right? Yes, I, and this is totally what works. This is what all of the neuro, I mean, every neuroscience out there that's putting their work out, they're saying the same thing. The diet people, they're all saying the same thing. They're, I mean, it's all works together. We are figuring out how our bodies work. It's not what Rene Descartes thought. It's not what we always thought it was. Um, and it, it just takes people like you really getting it out there and, and making your minions to spread it out more. Excellent, Mary. It's been great talking to you about your whole evolution through pain science, through CBT and to ACT, and of course, the unique environment that you work in. Tell people how they can learn more about you and follow your work. Um, so I do have a website and it's uh, marydoylept.com. And you're welcome to come on and send me a message. I would love to have an actual message on there. And then I also have... Um, Email uh, marydoylept at gmail.com. Excellent. So make sure to check out her website. It's marydoylept.com. Go in there and check out the great things that she's doing. And if you have any questions about the environment she works in or the things she's learned, you can reach out to her there. And I thank Mary for joining me this week on the Healing Pain Podcast. It's been a pleasure. Make sure to share this episode out with your friends and family on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or wherever anyone's hanging out talking about acceptance and commitment therapy and other forms of psychologically informed pain care. I'm Dr. Joe Tata, and we'll see you next week. Thanks so much, Joe. It was great. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. That's integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.